So, okay. Hello, everybody. This is James DeBow on the Scovenant Season 3. And, well, the special guest in today is myself being interviewed by Mr. Curtis Watts. So I'm going to hand the mic straight over to Mr. Curtis Watts. And you do what you got to do. You ask me what you need to ask. Yeah, man. So welcome to this uh, a special edition for Black History Month 2021, which is uh, really important. We've come out of uh, lockdowns and stuff like that. And so I sort of put it on James and I said, you know what? What about your story? He's got an interesting story to tell. And those who may have read the Echo article by Patrick Graham, uh, James has uh, been labelled now as the uh, Liverpool's answer to Indiana Jones, which is amazing. Oh, yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, so let's start at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so, A, what was the first place that you went to? It, because there's a lot about you traveling around the world. You've been to 39 countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not only as not as a tourist so much, but as somebody who's got like right into the community and Most stuff. Definitely. For me, yeah. I think that's one of the best ways to travel is to be doing community work and getting right down with the actual people. Yeah. And not locked on a, a resort, you know, where they're eating beans on toast for breakfast and things like that. Definitely get so, out there. So, you w- did you just go on holiday? Or yeah. So when or you say what? the first holiday, yeah, what I usually do is, I mean, the first one, just going to Spain when I'm okay. 1987 with the family. But first, with this is the journey, 2006, going to Cuba. And it was very, I was always curious about Latin America, just like I was curious about other parts of the world, Brazil, you know, um, anywhere, Fiji, Africa, all over. So when I started with Cuba, that is really where I started wanting to get out there now. And every year, this is my what I'm going to be doing. So Cuba, well, my reason for going to Cuba, very curious about the Cuban people. And I didn't understand um, too much about it. I knew there was Africans taking their slaves. But I didn't really understand the fact that there was, what would you say your average, what is the ethnicity of your average Cuban? You know, because there's many different people. So Africans, Spanish, Native Americans, some people can be the mixture of all the free things. And then that's a typical Cuban, you could say. I mean, you could look at Fidel Castro. He doesn't look like he's a Cuban. I don't know if his roots are Italian or something like that. Mm. So, I mean, you've got different ethnicities there. But I was interested in the story of Cuba. I couldn't find, he is indigenous peoples there. Mm. But when we say indigenous peoples in the day and age within, um, it's not like where you could go into the Amazon rainforest and you're going to see many different tribes you will see people in cuba but they're not recognized like um i wouldn't even say they have strong rights even just like probably most of the native americans would ever go anywhere and it's right through the americas so you're suggesting that some of them will maybe homeless and things like that or what what is it what how did they stand out in that way um well as, as far as um black people there do you mean or which, yeah, which the, the native medicine. Yeah. Well, when you see, you see, you, you deal with these censorships. So with censorships, you might just read on the internet, read in the news, how many, cause this is what I used to do. I All the countries I used to travel to, or I wanted to travel to, I always checked how many indigenous peoples are there. So uh, you're going by censorships now. So when you go by censorships, you don't know how accurate these are. They did the same thing in Hawaii where they decide to say, well, if you have less than 50% Hawaiian blood, it, you might not be considered as a Hawaiian. And it was just all people having their own things on as usual. Yeah. You know, but um, there is actually people there who you just look at them, you can see he's a Native American. You can just see that look, but they don't know to call themselves a Native American. They could even be 90, 80% Native, Native American. Yeah. But they don't go and get a DNA test they speak Spanish, maybe. Maybe they've abandoned some of the heritage through what happened with, through the history of Europeans, you so, know. So, so when you say native, were these? Did you did you in your, in your research <laughs> were these from the Taíno? Tribes? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you got Taíno. Um, also, you got like Caribs and Arawaks. Yeah. But then actually, the, I think they're more down. Well, the thing is, in a sense, Taíno was almost like a a, a, a soft empire. In yeah, 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 yeah. There was one blanket term, and within that was your Caribs and other tribes. Oh, we've re- 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 removed the countries yeah, and yeah. just deal with when there was not like because borders. They, yeah, 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 to, yeah, know, yeah, skip, yeah. Skip different islands, and and you know, uh, unlike Europeans, you know, yeah. generally they wouldn't like 
drain the resources and go to another island, certain amounts of them would stay. Yeah. And again, they would uh, represent different denominations as far as I remember from my sort of research into that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, so so where, 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 do you know what the general, you know, what was the general origin of those natives? Well, they're going to be the peoples that the first entered the Americas. Um, now, this goes back to when I've talked many times about ancient America. Because we have to talk about these things to recognise migrations that came into these lands, well, into this continent. So when we're looking at evidence, what is the oldest person? It's Lucia in Brazil that they found. There's, I mean, there's talks that they, on the California coast, some 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 believe that there's bones 90,000 years ago that was found. You know, people talk about it. Dr. David Imhotep, you speak about Africans um, about 56,000 years ago navigating to the Americas following the currents of the ocean. Now, I mean, it's difficult sometimes. I, mean, I like comparative studies. I look at different things, but I also like to look at, like, what is realistic date? Yeah. So just by what they found, we're going by Lucia in Brazil. I've been to Brazil, and I'd say Brazil is uh, has a lot, a large concentration of black people there. Yeah. Um, That's the, the largest... Th- uh, in the slave African trade, isn't it? You know, most definitely. Of Africa, yeah. So, but then when you're there, depending on where you're going... So I'd be in a tourist, you'd be in the tourist area. It seems like the black people are more further away. Mm. But but we was we was good for this to get out of that place because the good thing was is the more further you go out, you start getting ripped off less. Mm. Everything uh, the restaurant starts tastes nicer and also cheaper. The, you're away from the big con. Yeah. Because it's a con in a tourist zone. This is the way and this is what I it's a long time ago to you've got to move about Communicate with the local people if you really want to have that true experience, you know. And that's the same with um, Mexico. You know, obviously, my reason for Mexico, um, that was obviously a couple of reasons. It was wanted to meet the Mayan people. Mm. But it's going back to when he was saying, oh, 2012, the end of the world, you know, all that one. Yeah. And so I went there September 2012, 2012 just to, I, I knew we're in the end, but I knew, I, I had this feeling it's something else. So let me go and see what that something else is. So when I get there now, um, I'm speaking to all the different people from a local person on the street to people who are the Mayans, to everybody, anyone I could find that could give me information. But they all said the same thing, and that was unbelievable. So it showed me that your average Mexican is not as brainwashed as what you think. Compared to say maybe this, I, I believe that Mexico has a very strong culture. I mean, there's other parts of strong culture, but I mean, like when you look at some of their pyramids, you've still got Mayan people there now. You know, okay, a lot of people do speak Spanish, but I found that uh, Mexico, their history is quite strong. Also speaking, I know that a lot of black people were taken there into slavery into Mexico, but you also had indigenous black peoples. But it's hard to identify to say, well, was he brought over in the slave trade or is he an indigenous black person? It's yeah, it gets yeah. complicated. Like so, it's really detective studies on this one. It you is, know, yeah, and very hard to decipher because a lot of the history has been wiped clean by European yeah opinions. And I had a bit of the same propaganda. problem Madagascar because you've got indigenous black people there. You've also got people who came from Indonesia a couple of thousand years ago, and it's disputed who got there first. But I. Definitely, I think the Africans would get there a lot earlier than 2,000 odd years ago. And um, then you got African slaves being taken into Madagascar. So when they're being taken to slaves now, as a result right now, so when I'm speaking to black people there, are these black people who brought over in the slave trade or are these black people that came, the Bantus that came 3,000 years ago or something? Yeah. And that, that's it gets confusing because you can't just look at someone and say, no, he's one of the Bantus that first came or he came in the last 400 years. So there's only you can only get so far. Yeah, there's a lot of... Like Linguistics still play a little part. Mm. Isolated places. I went to a place called Moramenga in Madagascar, where the people, I met more local people. Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone's local. It's just, it's just one, one, when you go to Madagascar, you see many, many different looks mm. in Madagascar. It's Africa. You know, I'd say probably the majority would be African people. And then obviously, a couple of Indian people, yeah. like people from Indonesia and other parts of the world, and that. But these are like, it's got me very, very interested, wanting to know about 
the first peoples who reached these places. Yeah. That's what it was mainly was, you know. So, so can we just jump back in time a little bit to, as a child, did you ever imagine yourself being, were you interested in anything like that as a child? Into traveling or? Not so much traveling, because I think everybody wants to travel, but you know. Indigenous. Um, yeah, being interested in like the origins of things and yeah, yeah. that type of thing. But did that, did you get a buzz off like finding out origins of things? I, I was well? always very, very curious from young. Mm. Ask a lot of questions. And when when your mum bought me a globe and I had maps, just fascinating looking at the maps, spinning it round. You see America, South America, you see Africa, everywhere you just, just so you start forming ideas. That's why I think if you have a child, it's good to have a map for them or the globe. That's a good present for them. No because, definitely. I mean, that's education. And also I started forming ideas around just by looking at maps, you know, looking at, well, Indonesia's by Australia there. I could go from there to there then. You just just de- just studying everything and like neighbor neighbor countries as well. What what kind of interactions were they having together? You know from, but well, yeah, from young I was always watching the Aboriginal Australians on the TV, yeah. African tribes, Maasai tribes, and so I knew about a lot of these peoples. And I knew one day I'm gonna go and visit these people. I knew it from young and start in 2006 the big mission. So uh, yeah. so with with uh, Madagascar was that. W- when were people taking their uh, slaves for what was it for? Um, was it for uh, <coughs> vanilla? Was it? I think they were growing there. Um, oh, well, originally, vanilla. originally, um, <coughs> just when the Dutch, the French, because they speak French in Madagascar, but there's a part where they speak English as well. Mm. So you'd have a French connection. You'd have, I believe, even you'd have a Dutch. Is it a Dutch connection as well? Probably, yeah. Yeah. In those early days. Yeah. Yes. So. Have you seen the size of Madagascar? This is a the huge biggest island off the east coast of Africa. Yeah. Really huge. Tropical rainforest for uh, uh, most amazing. It's probably it's probably might it might be the largest island in the world of tropical zones. Mm. I believe Madagascar is. Yeah. So, I, so were you all also interested in like the wildlife and stuff and like the nature <laughs> of things? Is that why you went out into y- the sort of wilderness part of place? Um well both, like, like I do a safari when I went to Kenya, in Madagascar, went to a national park where you see the lemurs. Have you, you've heard the lemurs? Yeah, yeah. He, like, a m- bit like monkeys, a bit like... Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was a wildlife freak as a kid, so I know really <laughs> almost every species of Oh, animal, I always loved like animals. Mean, yeah. Always loved animals, though, you know. That's yeah, for real. So, definitely... They're, they're actually endangered at the moment, uh, most lemur species now, unfortunately. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Exploitation within the forests and things like that. Um, so, so, what was the first, like, did you, when did you first start saying, okay, I'm going to keep doing this? Uh, well, like I say, begin 2006, and <clears throat> once I got to about 2012, mm. I knew this is my life. Yeah. And because that year, that's when I started going a couple of places now, like, in one year. Mm. You know, from, from Q- like, Cuba 2006. Thailand, two thousand seven, Venezuela, two eight, um, two nine. I went to Europe. That was Europe, uh, Holland, and place like that. And then once we get to when we got to now, yeah, Brazil, two thousand ten, Morocco, two eleven. Then from there, that's when I started wanting to go a lot of places now. And then just every year trying to go four to five countries. Then the next year, two thirteen. I remember I went to Fiji, Dominican. And Mexico, no, actually Mexico was two twelve actually, and Hawaii went to in Mex in two twelve, and Los Angeles. So I just started like wanting to just. It was about moving around different places in the world. Yeah. What am I gonna see there? Uh, you know, like, and then there's some places I already know I'm gonna find something there mm. before they go. When you done your research and all well, do me research. You yeah. came across some information that made you inspired you to want to yeah. go to that place. Well, Fiji was a funny one, you see, because this was a bit more spiritual than just researching mm. see because uh researching but when you're doing like uh i, I call it spir- spiritual researching mm. it's completely different it's like your mind your spirit your, your heart it's, it's all got to be combined into the kind uh, into the one Absolutely. and it's like something is leading you to that answer mm. you know what i'm saying which makes it easier it's like when i went to fiji before i went i had the feelings that oh, i'm gonna meet someone important out there i don't know if it's gonna be a chief um, some sort of someone of importance, 
Then when I got the the connection with the chief, it was like it was all set up. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Where I read a little bit about that in your article. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Like meeting the high chiefs, and that was what 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 it was, it was through communicating with the local people, and I knew their history about them saying they came from Lake Tanganyika in East Africa, fifteen hundred BC. So I'm sitting there. Then when they've got when they I meet up with them, speaking to them for about an hour, and they're asking me questions about Africa. Also, what do I know about the Fijians? And I'm letting them know, well, I knew that you came from Africa. I said, uh, there's a guy there called Renoko Rashidi, obviously, yeah. rest in peace. And he's a person who sh- I watched. I just went on the internet one day and then I was looking at Fiji, t- putting in Africa, because I'm trying to look at connections. Then he comes up, Renoko Rashidi. Mm. And then he was there and it was like, he was the only person who I could talk to or ask or observe a video to be able to, for me to go out there, like, I mean, I was already traveling anyway. I was already into tribes. What Renoko Rashidi did, he opened up this massive area of research for me to go into, which I didn't think existed. I didn't know these black people in the Philippines, orig- indigenous, didn't know they were in Thailand. Mm. I didn't know they were in, they had black civilization, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. I didn't know about the Indus Valley civilization, was black people's, Dravidians, and people like you within the Andaman Islands. So, because I didn't know all this, I mean, and I'm always a curious person. Like, I was looking at people in Indonesia, like, they look a bit black then. You know, like, and then the Malays, the Malaysian people looking, they look like they could be mixed. Mm. But I was right. <laughs> like, the average Malay are mixed. Yeah, Some of them are mixed with the indigenous peoples of those lands, the black peoples. And they call them, well, I met the Orange Asley tribe there. And um, there's other tribes, there's the Batek tribe, but then you've got a tribe that's across a mixture of both. They call them Austronesian. Mm-hmm. And these Austronesians are the ones who, they were the mixture that went back into like China, Taiwan, and would come into Southeast Asia later. So there's names like, they call them the, say like you got the Mongoloid race. Yeah. Then they say the Australoid. So what they do is they deal with the Australoid and the Mongoloid mixed in Southeast Asia. Mm. But I think the mixture starts in um, it starts in Taiwan and Southern China because that's where the Austronesian comes out of. But you go back further, Shang Dynasty would have been a black um, civilization. Was it directly from Africa or was it just indigenous black people there? Mm. It's disputed, but there's a lot of African symbolism or there's these, it's like the Buddhas. The Buddhas just look like African people. But there is black people in Asia yeah. who have been there a very, very long time. So sometimes it can be confusing the two. Oh, just on that, um, mm. did you say you went to the Andaman, some of the Andaman Islands? No, I was meant to go or there. To I go? couldn't. I couldn't go there when when I was going to visit the Mani in Thailand. I was going into Cambodia, Angkor Wat, and see the Khmer people. Then I was going into Vietnam. I had to go on this twelve-hour drive to visit the Hmong people, and um, Sri Lanka. Went to see the Vedas. Now, in um, the country you were just saying then about what was the country? The Andaman. I it, yeah, the Andaman. I wanted to go there from Southeast Asia, but you've got to go to India. Yeah. You yeah. need permission because it belongs to India. Of course. So yeah. that's why I didn't end up going because it's it would have been. It's also very restricted, isn't it, as to who goes with, thankfully, but it's, it's, it's starting to. There's a bit of tourism starting to seep into it and stuff and, and you know, uh, exploitation. Well, I'm sure that. you might have heard of the. The uh, missionary uh, Christian. Oh, the Seminoles. Yeah, well. Yeah, when he went over to the Seminoles. Yeah. Island, now, um, he's gone 2018. Yeah, yeah. I was going to go 2017. Oh, okay. Didn't go oh. because I would have had to go to India first, and then it didn't win enough time on the trip. Yeah. Uh, but he's gone there trying to convert them, and you just don't try to convert these people. I go there to learn about them. Yeah, yeah. Not try to get them to think like me. Yeah. You know, if, if they want to take on any your ways that's their own free will to do that. Which they, which they clearly don't because they don't welcome I- outsiders there. Um, I mean, Renoko Rashidi's been to see them. Okay. He got so a good response. He maybe he had a fixer of some kind, be yeah. him or something, but this guy just went there. He went with a couple of boat fishermen who took him, he sort of, you know, moored the boat. Yeah, he done a mile it. off or whatever, and then he went on there. The first thing they Illegal. shot was his Bible. Yeah, the first thing yeah. The first arrow went into his Bible. 
So it's not like they did. They weren't familiar with that. Wow, and it's kind of like Bible. symbol. Yeah, symbolically, you know what I'm saying. They shot his Bible. Wow, he didn't take the hint. Oh, okay, he ended up getting shot with some arrow, didn't he? And <laughs> end up. Um, there's a lesson there. I mean, I'm sure in his in his mind, from his belief system, he thought he was doing the right thing, but imposing your will on other people without their say so, you know. Yeah, kind yeah. Of, I mean, I don't. Don't say you deserve to die personally. Oh, of course not. But you like, it's it's um, you've got to think what a lot you're of hubris doing. involved in going to other places, and and it, it does stink of colonialism in some senses. And yeah. I can see why people who does you, you know, know what there's, there's probably yeah. less than a, or a hundred round a hundred people on that island or something. So the, the gene pool is is very yeah. uh, sensitive. Something goes back to the 1800s where a Europeans took some, he started shooting at some of the um, enemies and. It was from that time where one of them got killed, going back in the 1800s. I think it was, the, I don't know, it was the British, but that's what led to the paranoia of outsiders mm. are going to come in and bring problems, especially if they've got weapons that they've never seen before. They're throwing arrows and they've got bullets, haven't they? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what about, um, like you said, you've been to Middle America, I, 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 you know, in Mexico. Have you been to yeah. South America as well? Yeah, South America, Venezuela and Brazil. <laughs> Oh, yeah, um, and then some of them Latin American countries like Dominican. Um, I've been to Jamaica, Barbados, but the Latin American ones, Cuba. Cuba was the, that, see, that was the place I needed from the beginning. Mm. And the reason why, I'm happy I went there first rather than last or middle, because when I realized that you can't stay in this area, this is communism, Cuba, 2006. So I had to just go on some far journeys. I linked with lo- local people, and he explained to me that you come with us, we'll look after you. Mm. So basically, you want to go on a journey, four hours or three hours or whatever, you get on the coach with us, you pay what we pay. So all the tours will pay more, and plus you don't know where you're going after time. So we go down to areas like Cardinal, Madansa, and this was just a completely different Cuba completely different than and I was just made up to be around real people and that's all I I always try to say for real genuine people because you know it's all about people what can you get from you yeah of course when you're tourist you mean yeah 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 that's all it is until you meet some local people plus as well how we look and that we just blend in with a lot of people oh for real yeah yeah you get mixed hollering at you in different languages yeah. and stuff like so, that. Yeah, well. So as long as like um, you're quiet and you don't say nothing because there was these, I remember this, um, I kept on seeing them everywhere in Cuba, a big van like something up one of them old movies where you can stand outside the back, like there's no roof on it, mm. there's only like roof on where you're driving. Oh yeah. It, I can't even describe it, yeah. They just keep pigs in them kind of things and that. And every now and again you see that van going past and it'd be a load of Cuban guys. But everyone was always paranoid when they would always drive past. So, But I'm just looking at the face and I'm looking, these look like some dangerous dudes. <laughs> I don't know if it was to do with, like, they're on the s- I'm wondering, are they on the side of Castro or are they on the other side? That's what I was wondering as well. Yeah, yeah. At the Cuban posse or something they were called and that. But I was just told, you know what, just don't really talk around certain people and you just blend in. So uh, I'll use my brain and thought. If it's time to talk, it's time to just be quiet. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's it's a curious thing, Q, because I hear a lot of people who do spend some time, and I know quite a few people who spend quite a lot of time and have got good contacts there. Obviously, the music and the food and everything, the culture is like like a vibrant and amazing there. But there's always been, just like because of the nature of the place and the politics of the place and the history of that politics, there are going to be different sort of divisions there of, way people like yeah the, the social politics I suppose yeah. and things well like a that. good question to ask about Cuba is, is Cuba racist mm. now uh, how I'd put it is um because Fidel Castro was asked this question mm. because it's a it's a question in a lot of Latin Latin American countries they're quite racist the darker they are they treat treat you worse so um I noticed that um in Cuba because Fidel Castro basically said that he was asked about what can you do about racism, and the answer he gave was basically, we've got more important things to focus on. So we didn't dismiss it. He just basically wanted to focus on other things. Yeah. So that's thing. People don't take uh, racism too serious. You see, they just look and think, well, okay, your country, you might have problems with 
the West or the, whoever you got problems with. But at the end of the day, sort your own country out with racism because it's just a common problem which has been put there by the European in the last couple of hundred years. So what about from your experience then? Did you feel like there was any sort of like caste system there or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I always, I always, always notice these things like um, who who has the better jobs. Mm. Um, now Cuba's a funny one. Like Cuba, how I'd put it is, it's racist in a way of like caste, like the dark you are, because this is something put in by the Spanish. And your the different European countries might have had a different way of how they view view you or treat you. They all treat you bad, but the, the different ways like um the Spanish and the Portuguese, when they are first going on their expeditions, they're the first of the Europeans. I'm not talking about the Greek Romans, I'm I mean yeah. just going exploring that. So they're the first there and they a lot of them, especially at that time, had Moorish blood in them, the Moors. Mm. Yeah, cool. So, I know the Moors were expelled 1491, and, and then next minute Columbus has gone where he's going. But the Portuguese have already did over, already started their expeditions, Henry the Navigator. and So, they've they basically crossed, and they've took some slaves and stuff like that. But their ways and how they view race, it's like the word, the N-word, mm. come from Negrito. Yeah. So you definitely got a lot of the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, you know, as far as they were the first to do what they're doing, you know. So <laughs> definitely, I see, I see racism. Most of these Latin American countries, yeah. I feel the black people don't have a voice. Mm-hmm. And another thing is, is that see, we're speaking English. Yeah. If they listen to us now, they've got to have subtitles. Maybe they don't speak English, or maybe if you wrote a book, you need to get these books converted into Spanish, because this is something what Renoco Rashidi did. He went to Latin America, and his, his mission was to get these books printed into Spanish as well. Oh, I see. It's like Sheikh Ante Diop. His books were in French, or was it? Yeah, it would be French. And Dr. Clark, it took him seven years to convert those books over into English also. So, you know, it's a team effort with this one. So have, do, have you, like, when you've been in these communities, have you, like, gone to local community centres and things like that and... Have you been involved in the community work there at all? I do it independently. Mm. So <clears throat> before I've gone there, I don't, I don't commute. I don't know. I don't even know people before I go. Only be in about about four countries where I've known people before I've got there. So I would say like Sri Lanka. Now we had all the time in the world to visit the Vedas. It was a seven-hour drive because I knew a shopkeeper here. And then he put me onto his brother. And then I got to, like, just go all over Sri Lanka, all over there. I mean, some of the most dangerous roads, well, one was in the Echo. This is called the Snake Bend. Mm. And this is just like, you don't have, and it's not even like you're in a small vehicle. You're on a big, massive coach. Mm. So imagine going on, like, a Snake Bend. Where you've got a turn on these big vehicles, oncoming traffic, and there's times where you're stuck. Mm. You're just stuck there for about an hour because he, one's got to decide who's going to let the other one pass. And it was just like some of these journeys, I look back and think. So this is one of those mountain roads. That's mountain it, roads, yeah. yeah. I think I've seen this because I saw it. I was watching a YouTube video about like the world's most dangerous roads or something along those lines. Mm. Yeah, man, and uh, there was <coughs> one which goes like, like this and like that somewhere. And I saw yeah. one like that. So it might be the same place. I'm not 100% sure. But it's like in Viet- familiar. It's like Vietnam, mm. going to see the Hmong people. Yeah. Now, I was disappointed when I got there because they weren't the tribes I was looking for. It's the people I'm looking for were the first people of Vietnam. Mm. The Hmong have only been there 2,000 years. Might sound long 2,000 years, but not compared to what the other people have been there, 40,000 years mm. and stuff. It's a big yeah. difference. But this, the Hmong are... They, <laughs> You know, you've got Yunnan in China, yeah, and you've got these mountain areas. Now, these mountains kind of border the Vietnamese borders. Well, you know, the mountains join basically join Vietnam. So these Hmong can have came over through the mountains. Well, that's why, because I couldn't really see them coming in the lower lands. They probably come over the mountains because they're already in mountainous areas anyway in China. Yeah. Now, some of the uh, ones in Yunnan, looking at pictures of them, they look very similar. To the Hmong, that's because most of them are the same. So what's the phenotype like? What's the well, 
you know what the thing, what we've seen, mongoloid race. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, these are scientific terms. These are not what oh, I'm oh, trying to use. It's yeah, just, yeah. it just so people understand and can go and research when you put put yeah. that in the search and that. But uh, the mongoloid type where, um, say, like, the only difference is with um, the Hmong. They're probably a bit older than most of the Chinese. When I say most of the Chinese, you, you see, like, you've got South of China, you've got North, and it's believed that the first people were in the South. These would have been black people originally. Mm. And it's funny enough, um, when you, I've, got, I've got these photographs there from the 1800s. It's a French photographer... And it's when Europeans were going into um, China, and they took pictures, and you see, and I'll have to one time I'm gonna have to get a little slide and do a little slide on these. Shows you the depictions of a lot of black people still in China over the hundred years ago. Mm. So they weren't completely wiped out from the Shang Dynasty or the Austronesian expansion. There were still traces and people there. But then there's another confusion thing in this in the Tang Dynasty in China, African slaves were being brought by Arabs to China, India, and Japan. Well, later on, it was Japan. You know, the Bantus in um, 1500s and that, the Black Samurai story. Yeah. But they were talking to China. So China have never been unfamiliar with black people. Do you know what I'm saying? There's always been a black presence in China. Yeah. They're just as far back as you can go. But then when you see a lot of the Europeans reaching China in the 1800s, a lot of them times, it's seen from there right to Chairman Mao that they disappear. Did Chairman Mao wipe them out? I don't know. Or did from the Quinn Dynasty? So there's these this little period of time where where did they go to? What happened to them? And these are questions that Chancellor Williams is asking. What happened to these people? Yeah, I suppose it depends on the state the status of them historically. Yeah. Like what were like we were saying before, what's the jobs that they would be mainly doing? Mm. Would that would they have uh, mixed with other local peoples over that over generations? Or Very good question. That mm. um, if you trace back um, old books, Chinese books, is a guy called Li Min, and he was supposed to explain about a race of people that were there before them, and they have many different names for black people, uh, all sorts of different names. You know, um, mad, mad. These, there's actually one called um, Kunlun slaves mm. in China, uh, and I'll get you the article for that one. And it's basically something happened to black. Pe- there was the small black people in China, and um, it co- came out in the Thai Times. And last time I looked, it was in the LA Times as well recently, and I was like, wow. And it's talking about when they killed, they were exterminating the little small black people. When I'm looking at, now, th- you might have seen it on the TV, these celebrations where China have every, I don't know if it's every year or every couple of years, and they paint themselves brown. Black. I haven't seen that, actually, well, to be fair. Well, I only got onto this because a Chinese woman was explaining, oh, there's some celebration. Mm. So I did see it on the news, but I didn't know there was a connection going back. And the reason why they're still celebrating, because they were warned by the last pockets of these people, you kill us all off and your crops will die, and you'll be cursed for the rest of your time in your land. You know, basically like that. And it seemed like that prophecy, they took that serious. Yeah. Because they're still celebrating. In Taiwan, they still do an indigenous people celebration. They have like an observation yeah. on a particular date. Of, it's of like some culture. of them native indigenous peoples of America, and they yeah. do things to keep the ancestors' spirits alive, yeah, keep well. singing the songs, dancing, chanting. And these are serious traditions that go way, way back in time. Way back. Have you ever been to, like, New Orleans or anything like that? The only part of America is California, oh, okay. L.A. That, that, um, I, I'm, I'm getting this from a TV drama, but it was a very accurate one called Treme. I don't know if you watched it. It was by the creator of The Wire. Um, I've seen The Wire. Uh, yeah, this was after The Wire. Um, when you watch that program, it's like being in New Orleans because if two people are speaking in a bar where there's live music on, they will show. They will have local musicians playing the music, and they will show the whole song, rather than just the incidental music in between. They will show like what happens in different parts of the society. It was based around after, after uh, Katrina, mm. because that was one of the most affected areas was the Treme region, right. in New Orleans, and um, and so uh, in that there was black people, um, which we would call African Americans. They don't call themselves that. 
Um, and one of the guys out of the wire, actually, can't remember his name in it, the old cop who used to make the little figures and stuff, he used to carve little figures. Uh, yeah, a bit like a Morgan Clark Freeman. Pe- Pardon? Clark yeah, okay. Clark thanks. Peters. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. He played this, th- they called themselves the Indians, right? And they dress in these massive flamboyant, uh, I think there's like St. Joseph's Parade or something. That they have this event as well as the Mardi Gras and the better known ones. Okay, They yeah. go out with like, these massive things with all feathers on and everything, yeah. Right. And they call themselves injured and they talk about being pretty. It's like they get a prize for who's the prettiest. And there was a scene in it, right, where the guy goes to the museum with his son. And he's seeing these, uh, it was West African, but I can't remember exactly what tribe it was. He was looking at these West African tribal headdresses and things which are made out of feathers and everything right. and, and suits made out of feathers and everything and and I've seen this before I mean I did read uh, uh, Malachi Z York years ago there was a bit conspiracy theory in there I don't know if you ever read his stuff some no, of it some no, of it's no. factual some of it's like plastic you know sho- yeah, yeah. shoehorned in a bit you know what I'm saying okay. yeah, it's a bit of bit misinformation but similar things when they, they w- one thing I did get out of that but they were talking about certain um, dancing Sort of a prose- um, ritualistic dances that okay. Native Americans do in some of the tribes. The Hopi, I think, was one of them. Hopi tribe, yeah, the yeah, Hopi tribe, yeah. and and that was very similar. Again, I'm not, I'm not. Re- this was a long, long time ago. My very young adult, so then there, and they were showing like the way that they do these prose- and the patterns that they make. If you were to map out the patterns that they make, it was very, very similar, as well as the headdresses and everything. So I just wondered if you. Come across any of that kind of thing, or um, not? I haven't seen the movie. What you're talking yeah, about on yeah. that, but um, I, you know, there's many different. Because when people think of Indigenous Americans, these are a bunch of many different tribes, yeah. you know. So everyone has their own. Some of them are very different than what one to the other. Of course, you yeah, know. Very so, yeah. um, I know about what well, my granddaddy from um, Trinidad, mm. and his dad born Guyana. They they, they talked about uh, um, the Caribs and the Arawaks. I think it's particularly the Arawak, yeah, yeah, the Arawaks, you know. So we, if you just read censorships like now, then you're gonna look and you won't see indigenous people certain places where they might actually be there, you know. So this is why you've got to get out to certain place yourself. Yeah. Speak to as many people as you can. If you've got to go on long journeys, link up with local people, tr- good local people, mm-hmm. not just anyone's gonna take you for the long ride and just yeah, that's course, it, you know. Yeah. So. Well, some people take a liking of you because you're taking an interest in the local culture, and yeah, you know, and they don't see much of that. Like we said before, most people go there as tourists and just want to see some traditional dance, like things like that. It's you like know? Uh, when I first, well, not first, went to Africa, went to Morocco first. Then I wanted to go further into Africa, so I went to Gambia, and I find Gambia is a great place, and it's an easy place for you to start if you've never been to sub-Saharan Africa, what they call it, and. You know, the amount of rasters there as well, I was very shocked. Like, yeah. uh, they love reggae music in Gambia. He was like reggae bars, and then also, go and they all say the same thing to you when they first see you, welcome home. Wow. Welcome home. And that feeling of welcome home is like, wow. So now, I mean, going further into it, what is great about Gambia, you have guides in your hotel, guides, proper guides, though. Not like guides like Thomas Cook or yeah. like these independent not reps, guides. Not, not, not reps, reps nothing yeah, like yeah. that. So it makes it easier. So how it works is is that, you know, you look after them for the day, it takes you where you need to go. So basically pay is, is a ferry because we, we were going across to um, Kunta Kinte Island. Really? Yeah, and wow. it was just like a maze from a kid watching routes to be getting taken there. So I'm just going over there with him. And, you know, every now and again, you might get people ask for, like, a little, like, security, hey, can you pay something or something? But it's very little money that people take off you. Mm. So I don't mind, even if you're driving somewhere and every checkpoint every now and again, they might take oh, one dollar yeah. off you. I'll take yeah, it. It's man. nothing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so Gambia, just, it was just amazing to go to the Roots Tour. And, and, I, and I was there with, I met a guy called Lamon there. He is, like, a, a professor there and that. And um, but the mentality I had then was about two fourteen. I was more like, well, just pure angry, mm. more than anything. Which or going on this tour, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. I mean, I'm happy at first, but then when I'm there and I'm looking, and he's telling me crocodiles eating our peoples in these waters. He's telling us like a bar, this dungeon here. This is where you were c- you were kept in. This one here is where you're going to be getting sent to. They're going to pick you up tomorrow, 
I'll take you on the journey. You know, it was just like, and then there's like a big area where it says never the game. Then it's showing you like all these records. You've got these plaques and it's, it's, it's just like madness. And like, even as soon as you get off the ferry, the, the boat don't even just come in right into the, sh- you'd have to like get out while the water's about that high. Mm. So what happened is, is I just look for the biggest African because you've got to jump on the shoulders. So I look for the biggest African out of them all. He's a little slim guy, about nine, ten stone. If I'm not jumping on his shoulders, and see some big, big brother jumped on his shoulders, give him a little dollar or whatever. That's all they asked for. And he'll do the same for you when you're coming back, so you don't get your feet wet and you know, because it's quite high in there. Yeah. So just, just there, like I say, though. I mean, I would have liked to be more on deeper into the research on it, but there was just more anger takes over, yeah. and I don't usually go places like that. So that's why in Gambia, like, I was researching, but it was more just just cursing, angry. And I realized then when the man told me, our history goes too, too far back. I knew that anyway, but he was explaining about Gambia itself, <laughs> surrounded by Senegal at the moment. Used to be part of the Malian Empire. Mm. Used to be a part of the Songhai Empire. And look, it's a little tiny country right now. Yeah. You know, but this, is, this has been a part of a larger empire. Yeah. And this is the thing of drawing these borders, and you know. Of course, I mean, I mean, in a sense, that happens with almost every empire, isn't it? Because they disperse over time. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, they, they retribalize sort of thing in a sense um, they do. and create borders. And I know, but obviously, with the British Empire in particular being like the most powerful, you know, in recent yeah um, centuries, um, you know, they were very organized at that thing, very, very. Um, very deliberate, and you very much very organized and knew what they were doing, you know. So definitely, um, there is that. I would love to go to Gambia because a lot of friends of mine who are djembe, djembe players go there, and the, there's a djembe factory where you can work and make the djembe's and everything. And then, um, which also, you know, I'm not great at reskinning my own djembe. I have to have someone like take me through it, and uh, and it's good to reskin your own drum and everything ceremonially yeah. and ris- ritualistically and stuff. But, uh, you know, when you work at this uh, factory, they give you a free djembe to bring back with you. You know what I'm saying? It'll be one that you made yourself. Oh, yeah, you know, so yeah. there's a lot in that, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So I would love to go there, and I've seen pictures like of it. it. It looks like it's beautiful you as would. well there, man, by and a lake and all I that. I think it's quite a safe place compared to, you know, certain other places yeah, in the world. it seems very peaceful there, That's what, and, and very wild, yeah. like, there's a lot of wildlife places there. Because there was actually there. someone we knew out there who has a house, like, about three hours deep into there. Not like in the tourist area. This is like bush area. Mm. But it was good to go down there and like a driver took us down there and that. And getting to eat their food because he took us into the fish market and this big massive freezers where you just pick your fish, pick some massive barracudas out mm. and then right there's the market with these scotch bonnets about that big. Wow. <laughs> you know, just every kind of vegetable I haven't really seen. So we just cooked up the galley with it and it was the most tastiest dish as but and being around the local people, because yeah. and it was what was interesting. They stay in these compounds. It's like a compound, and they all have like it's a big house because it's cheap to buy property in these places. You you just buy the land. You're getting acres of land. So when you're building these uh, the house, they'll build something for the people to look after your place when you're not there. So rather than some people say, "Well, I don't want them staying in my house," so I build like these like a like caravan like an outhouse. Type yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I noticed also the kitchen, they like to keep outside. Mm. So imagine in your house, you go outside into your garden, your kitchen would be there. It was like, wow. And this is to do with all cleanliness and things. Mm. Also as well, they don't like dogs in the house. Pets usually keep them outside. So there's loads of things that I learn. Plus it's a, it's a predominantly Muslim country as well, Gambia. Right. You know, where then I can go the other side of Africa, like Kenya, and Kenya is one that has a lot, a lot going on there. That is a big place. You know, it's not like little Gambia, and then uh, the Maasai tribes in Kenya, where they visited, went took about four hours, and I was interested in their stories. I've got like a couple of videos soon, so I'm hoping to start putting a documentary together. I think this is where I'm up to now. It's time to start doing a documentary. I've done slideshows. And I need to start doing a documentary with all the videos. Yeah. Because um, there was a story that I mentioned to one of the Maasai guys. And it's I've actually got it on the film. And I've explained to him. Because I know stuff before. I like to know stuff before I go. 
There's a story that I was listening about ancient Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania areas, about this mountain that they believe that um, the first humans came. And the story was um, a guy called Enfadishi. He's one of the best at it, Enfadishi. And it's basically a story that we uh, came from an aluminous egg. Mm. That this egg on this mountain. And then we came from the egg. So it's called the foothills of the mountains of the moon. I don't know if you've ever heard that saying about the mountains in Kilimanjaro and, you know, these areas and that. Mm. The foothills of the mountains of the moon. So I, I said this story to him and then straight away he gravitated towards me that, you know, we can have a conversation now. You know, and like he was asking me where I'm from. I said, well, my, I, take, I say Nigeria and he understands. When I say, if I were to say Trinidad, then he's going to know, well, you've been captured and this and that. So when I say, as uh, in Africa, you know, I always go as a Nigerian. That's very important for me. I don't say, I don't even talk English. I, okay, if you ask me where I'm from, England's my geographical place. Africa is my race. Mm. You know, that that's how I put, I put it like that. Yeah. And of course, we're born here and this and that, but this is how I'm taught from a child from my father. Just going back to slightly to the sort of trauma that you experienced when you were in Gambia. Um, like, do you, I mean, there's a thing called epigenetics. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. So where you're born with your genes that you've inherited, some of them are from your parents directly, some of them are more skipped a few generations are from great grandparents and things like that. Oh yeah. What happens is like you might be born with these genes switched on, and as you experience things in life, um, some of those genes might switch off and others will switch on. So actually, your genes change as you're alive. Interesting. Based, based on what the outf- outside external influences. This is a wow. genetically known fact, you know, scientifically known fact now. Wow. Um, people used to suspect it, but it's been proven a long time ago now. So, so but also I've got a poem called Genetic Flashback, which is about like me sort of me- a meditation, I suppose, on being captured as a slave and everything and, and going back through that okay. experience. Okay, uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's that trauma, that genetic trauma. Uh, yeah. Because... For me, part of the reason I've always been self-employed is because I don't like people telling me what to do in an arbitrary way. I don't mind if, like, I've got a job, I've agreed to, to take the job, my job's to clean tables, and then somebody says to me, oh, take the bins out, doesn't even say please. Do you okay, know what I'm saying? When yeah, that's not yeah, my job, yeah. someone else's job. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Even dealing with clients sometimes as a self-employed person, mm-hmm. people, like, try to talk down on you, like, they're your boss, and they deal... They won't give you all the information, then they'll like sort of switch what you're doing and tell you to do something you weren't there, you didn't agree to do. And I can't, like physically <laughs> and chemically, I can't handle that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I like yeah. to be my own boss. Do you know what I mean? Good, so good. And, and that's and, I, yeah. and for me, because my, like I was saying, we were doing one about here the other day, I was talking about living in Bootle till I was like five and a half. Okay. And uh, I was th- I'd never saw anybody my complexion or darker until like a Pakistani brother and sister joined our primary school, and I thought they would automatically want to be my friends in some kind of way. <laughs> I, I was quite shy as a kid because when I'd come out the house, I was saying this the other day. If I look and left coming out the house, and there were these lads there, these little boys, they used to always call me a gollywog. Gollywog when I came out the house, uh, there was that. There's a story very similar to I heard somebody in a conference when I was like nineteen, twenty. Um, it's the woman was talking about this kid who was waiting for milk, and it was exactly identical to what happened to me. Funnily enough, they're waiting for milk in school. You have to wash your hands first, right? And and the teacher said, I can't tell if your hands are clean. And the exact same thing happened to me in Bootle when I was in nursery. Mm. I remember coming out this playing in the little sand pit, and we all had to put our hands out to show we'd washed our hands. She said, I can't tell, but there's your milk anyway. Do you know what I'm saying? So then the next thing, the, the only, the first black people I saw on television was Sesame Street, yeah, and um, and Roots. So Roots being so traumatic to watch, you know, especially when they're trying to change well, his I've name to Toby. Well, I've seen that when I was about eight when exactly. I first yeah, watched it. It is trauma, yeah, you're right. When trying to change his yeah. name to Toby and he won't give up until, yeah. until he beats him right down, you know, and then he just says Toby in this horrible, well, brilliantly acted, you know, but like really weak, weak voice, the way yeah, he just yeah, does yeah. something to me, Toby. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And, and I just feel like part of my personality now is built on that, on, on trying to resist people telling me what to do and, 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 and forging yeah. me as a... P- and I've always been like about forging my own identity as a person. I know not, exactly not what you mean. Away. So I just wondering where you stand on that and if you've experienced yeah. anything like that. Yeah, well, well, it's when, you know, me father puts roots on for me when I was like nine or ten. Mm-hmm. So 
I, you know, you don't know, you, it's a movie, you've never seen this. I mean, you knew about like racing, but we didn't know it to that extent. So when you just said Toby was whipping him, trying to change his name, um, even just showing you them where they're fighting on the, you know, when they're fighting on the ship, they're fighting on the ship now, yeah, and the, the one of them's got a cannon, one of the Europeans fires a cannon or something, but that's after the slaves are beating them up, the, yeah. and then a few of them are getting thrown. We oh, fires the cannon straight into the yeah. onto the deck. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. that I yeah. mean, like, but you're so excited, being like, yeah, they're gonna get away. Mm. You know what I mean? And then no, they don't. They don't. Yeah. And then the stories continue, and then more people come on ships, and mm. then you see the odd slave rebellion. He runs away. What does he do? Chop his foot off. Yeah, man. You'll never run again. You know, like mad trauma things. Yeah. And then the other slaves will see. Whoa, we got his foot chopped off. Mm. I ain't gonna run away. Hi, master. And then yeah. try and be what they call in the house down on the field, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, but I quickly, what was good is, is I was school quite quick on, this is not all our history. This is just a little tiny part of our history. Crazy what's going on. But a ta- on a timeline of just even dealing with, say, 100,000 years, then you look to where we are today. Slavery is not going to be anything really on the It'd be a very small percent, four hundred years from a hundred thousand years. Yeah. Even though it's the most traumatizing, but then what they try and do is, is like it's like the word black, and they try and attach it with slave. Oh, of course. Like as if think of a slave, you have to think of someone black. Yeah. Which is wrong because a slave is something that is imposed on you. Yeah, of course. So yeah. it doesn't matter who you because are. Because we were talking the other day, it's not. It's not. African history, it's European history that interrupted African history. That's what it is, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just want to, yeah. So, so, um, yeah. As far as that's concerned, so, so, still, what about you though? Is what I'm kind of asking. Well, you the know, good like, thing what about is the way you feel about those things. Well, what, well, what, well, what do you think that's influenced by? Well, through th- through that journey, that trip to Gambia, yeah. and going and and something like I'm going to visit the place which I watched as a kid. Mm. So, when I've got there and I'm getting angry. This is when I, like I said, he, he, he schooled me real quick. A man named Lam and a professor there. He's explaining about, like I told you about the Malian Empire and Songhai. And he explained about Africa having very old civilization, connections to ancient Egypt and all sorts. He was talking to me about. And I was more enlightened by that than the negativity. Of totally. Course. From there, I knew which area of research I'm interested in mm. the most. Because I did used to talk about slavery a lot when I was younger. Yeah. And, I, and I'll be honest, it just made me angry. Mm. And also, you can get angry, and you're talking to people who are uneducated anyway and don't really understand people in Africa. These are well-skilled people. Yeah, of course. They weren't just some people. They were slaves. And they, and they make out sometimes, oh, they, it was better for them when they got to the um, America or the Caribbean. You know, this mad, like, just mental slavery... The chains come off, but it stays on the brain, basically. Yeah, it can do, yeah. yeah. But racism's like a global thing, though, as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can go back to 1500 BC when you've got the Aryans, the Indo-Europeans, coming into India, putting a caste system there. And then a thousand years later, the reason for Buddhism coming Mm. was to try and bring something back, what Hindu once was, before they was invaded. Mm. So, And originally, they had the story of praying on a mountain, and they had the same god as the Ethiopian god. It was a name like Marundi. Yeah, yeah, kind of very difficult to say. S- and then places like going to deep into the Pacific now, Micronesia, when I get to there now, a place called Guam. And the people are calling themselves, because they're like, you've got like the Mixuluk, where the mix of the Spanish and the indigenous black people. And then you've got like people from America, Japan, Philippines, all these different places. And when I was speaking to the average Micronesian, they call themselves Chimoras. Mm. I said, what's Chimoras? And they're going, well, we're the mixed shit. We're not the Micronesians. So they call the Micronesians, the black people there. And, and they call, they say the Chimoras, the mixed people. So uh, this was like something very, I had to break a lot of stereotypes out there. And I told them what, why I'm here and what I do. Mm. I am searching for the oldest people. So I might have to look for, I have to look for the darkest people if I'm searching because that's how it works, the oldest people. So I did find a few indigenous Micronesians and they're treated like, they're treated really down, you know, really down. Yeah. They're very shy and the some of them don't really, they'll talk to me now, 
but then when someone's going past on the street, sometimes they're like, you know, um, I don't know Just what don't it is. Edge, you mean? So yeah, I've yeah. seen a bit something similar in Hawaii. In Hawaii, I find that um, the local Hawaiians, the actual Hawaiian people, because a lot of them live in really rough parts, not like um, in where you go a tourist zone in just Honolulu, for example. You can see all their houses from far. Now you you see I seen a couple of them that were like just on a level, and he was I was having conversations about Africa to them. This is two thousand twelve when I was in Hawaii, and he was explaining about um, Africa is the land of the gods, and this is this is this this is where they were making these connections from Africa all the way to the Pacific, and he t- and it's like command man. He talks about a story where, like, you know, a lot of the times when Europeans were attacking Hawaii, an old Hawaiian tradition that had their connection back to Africa where they call for reinforcement, an old Hawaiian tradition. So I was like, wow, this... And then in Fiji, when they're talking about Africa, then I went to Tonga. Tonga's, like, in going into Polynesia, and then you see the Stonehenge there, the three-step pyramid, you know, and then also... Seeing animals like um, a flying fox, mm. fish and pigs. It was like animals that I've just never like seen before or heard of. And then some of the fruits that you see. But these, I asked them, Jews come from Africa. And they'll just say we came from Fiji, which they did come from Fiji. Because they entered Fiji 1500 BC. Mm. Later, coming into Tonga, not long after that. So I, I can see this. So the the people who were called Melanesians that stretched from Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, right down into Fiji, New Caledonia, they have a they seem to memorize Africa more mm. than some of the rest of the Sorry, Pacific. I meant to ask, have you been to Papua New Guinea? No, but okay. that's that's definitely on the list. Yeah, me too. I would love to go there. Watch a lot of videos about that. And you see, I've done a bit of research in Papua New Guinea because I was thinking I should have flying to Port Moresby, but that is you seen Ross Kemp. Ross Kemp went there. Oh, I didn't see it. Well, it's really rough gangs. there. But there's other parts of Papua New Guinea, like Bukhar Islands, or you've got these other little tiny islands that run off it. And some of the islands are actually the best places, and you will see some of the oldest cultures. Unless you're going to a rainforest there in Papua New Guinea when he's still the tribal. Yeah. But make sure you've got to be careful with... Oh, we, we've got to be yeah, very careful. I watch, a, I watch a lot of videos about... I don't know why, I just come across yeah. them on my feed. And, yeah, man. and then you're looking at the catch connection right through from Asia. Like I say, I met the Vedas in Sri Lanka. And, you know, a lot of these look bl- just like black people. Now, a lot of them also have straight hair. Black features, but straight hair. It's like... So these, like, Dravidian types. Aboriginal Australians, when I was going to visit them, how much I felt so bad for them people. You know, we even going back where they were taken to breeding camps to mix with Europeans to try and get them lighter and lighter and lighter. You know, there's a movie called Rabbit Proof Fence where they explain that breeding process and stuff. And just looking at them, the amount of alcoholics on the streets that are on drugs or something. And it's just like, whoa, you feel for these peoples. And there's many different peoples. Like Australia, the first peoples are small black folks. You weren't people who came in with loose hair. Yeah, of course. You've got to do your research on this one because when Europeans are explaining about research, they do it from their own scope. Renok Rashidi said he done something called looking at Aboriginal Australian through African eyes. Mm. And then you, it's a completely different scope. Yeah. You're recognizing that they came out of Africa, they're the first people, I mean, well, they're the first, one of the first peoples to leave through Asia, go into Africa. Yeah. But they used to Australia. think it was 40,000 years ago, and now it's going back 60,000 60, years. years yeah, man. Then they said 4,000 years ago, there's a connection where they found 11% of Aboriginal Australians have Indian in the DNA yeah. in the last 4,000 years. So that will probably explain the looser here, mm. where Tasmania, they're the small black folks. You've got people in New Guinea, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, who are very small, mm. unlike the people in the lower lands. So these small peoples seem to be the oldest wherever you go in the world. Yeah. I know they're in the Congo rainforest. Yeah, oh, yeah. Parts of Cameroon. They're, they're called the Baka. Yeah. Baka tribe, yeah. Yeah, some might say pygmies and or whatever. Yeah, the Baka's the true name. Yeah, the true the name and that. Yeah. Then I look at that um, in Southeast Asia, like I say, Philippines, the Eta, very small people. These just look like the first type of people that left Africa. The Odin Jasli, 
fairly short people in Malaysia, Thailand, the money. There's only 300 people left in the money, and these are becoming extinct. Mm. So this is another reason why I do what I'm doing also, because one, I've always been a person to stand up against racism. I've always been a person to want to speak about our history. And when I came across, like I say, when Renok Rashidi opened the doors up to show me that these black folks in Asia, and like, then he told me also, Renok, he said that, you know, he explained that he's never visited some of these peoples. He didn't go into some of these jungles and rainforests, which I thought he did, you know. So that was, that's basically it anyway, man. And I'd stay very, very spiritual. You know, that's what it is, spiritual connection with these peoples, these local peoples. Because if you've never met these people, you just see them on pictures, videos. How are you going to get close to people who you've never met before? So you must connect to them spiritually yeah. to make that better connection. You know, so I just gonna assume you're another European in a sense, you know, yeah. like a tourist, so, so to like, say like in, in New Guinea, when uh, there's a thing going on where even though they might know you're coming because someone's ran round the corner and told they're coming, you know what I mean? The people with money, mm. <laughs> so do you ask you for tobacco? Do you like come up with the arrows in it like this and yeah. do this sort of like threatening traditional thing they would do? And you've got to give them some tobacco and whatnot, you know what I'm saying, as a, a sort of ritualistically, but it's a bit of a you know, little local scam, if you like, you know, no one's, like you said before, a little pouch of tobacco isn't going to cost you much money as a European. You know yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know and, uh, do you wanna, have you got any last question? Just because we're coming, at yeah. I know we're coming at the end. Anything yeah, but, that you well want to? Yeah, I just want to know really, like you were just saying about um, uh, Dr. Rashidi, like you were talking about like um, how he'd never been a, in, as deep as you into a lot of these places. So, what do you, in the long term, what would you, wha legacy-wise, what would you like to leave behind as what you've done about the research that you've done? Wh what have you done on top, on okay. top of that? What's been the actual, you okay. know, what have you, what you, what you I'd like to leave as a legacy? Um, I'd like to leave as a legacy, as, of course, a traveller, but a person who will go to far lengths, far journeys, whether there could be dangerous dangerous roads, anything, you know, whatever it's got to meet, I've got to do to get there. It's like a reporter. Mm. If someone goes to a war-torn place or whatever, some of them just get off and then some of them, I want this story. Yeah, I'm one of them. I want the story. And I'm just fascinated. I mean, just I'm still, f sometimes like, I, I can relate to what Renok Rashidi said. Sometimes he goes to bed thinking about these indigenous peoples. And I'll be honest, I'm totally related to them. So when I was having a conversation with him, now, here's, how, here's a funny thing. Let me just go back to 217. Before Renok Rashidi came here and done any event, I sent him a message, and I asked him, I said, I'm going to visit the Mani peoples. Could you help me get there? This is when I found out he hadn't been in there. So he said to me, I have no idea. And I said, well, you've been there, haven't you? You know, like, this is how I explained. He said, no, I've been to do lectures there. It doesn't mean he went in to visit the people. And I'd done the same when I was going to the Philippines to see the Etta. Could you help me? I can't help you, my brother. Wow. So then I realized then that I've got to do this by myself now. And the fact that I did it, come back, spoke to Renoko and said, this is how it went down. And he was like, I'm damn proud of you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, so you want to do a documentary? Are you going to do a book? Yeah, there's been, uh, there's been someone who's asked me, um, could he write a book for me? Um, Patrick Graham, I just say his name. Yeah, he's asked me uh, not long after the article in the Echo. And I think, you know, he said maybe next year. But it's about the time. Yeah, yeah. If you gotta be if he's ready at the time when I want I wanna start doing that, then that's fine. Cause time goes fast and then, you know, Patrick's a busy person also, you know, he's got a lot of things going on. But hopefully going into next year, you know, I take his word that when he's got free time. And also I need to get a documentary done. So I need to soon sort stuff out with Chase with that, you know. Yeah. You know, definitely. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation anyway on discovering, you know. So, and I'm happy that you've. Uh, I think you're a great interviewer, also. You know, you ask different kind of questions, and um, we. I think we come on about an hour now so yeah, nice one. time flies when you're having fun isn't yeah, it yeah man so this is the uh, the special for Black History Month 2021 and we finally heard your side of the story so let's hope there's more to come and definitely do that book I would say because it's educational and definitely trying to get more books into schools and things like yeah. that at the moment well there's something else actually I think Chase mentioned it to me one time I thought it was a brilliant idea what he said also a picture book he said mm. yeah. a audio, audio book a audio book yeah 
Well, I mean, any book that you get published now, whether it's self-published or, or traditionally published, you, you, it pretty much is quite easy to get it made into an audio, audio book nowadays. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, but definitely, I would listen to it. I would definitely love to have a physical book about it and look forward to anything that you produce in the future. And hopefully I can... Uh, one of the, one of those uh, adventures with you one oh, day. Oh yeah, definitely. Wicked. Yeah, man. yeah, and also you know, um, thanks for being a guest on the Scoveling. Yeah, man, also nice you know, I, yeah. everyone enjoyed what what you did. Yeah. You know, you brought something to the table. You talk black history. You tell me your story about going out South Africa. Mm. These inspiring things. Yeah, and it's you know, it's I think when we more we can come together because we've got so many different guests on the Scoveling. Yeah. You know, people from all sorts. You seen Richie the, on the other day. Mr. Silky Skills, both sports, yeah. going on, Lons Westcraft, Patrick Graham, Braz Congo, yeah. vegan brothers, you know, Muslim brothers. <laughs> so we've got all different brothers on here. So, you know, let's just keep it going. And this is the special edition to um, the season three, mm-hmm. you know. But um, anyway, if you want to say your goodbyes, Curtis, I'm just. Yeah, man. Well, no? it has been a uh, privilege to interview you. And, you know, I've lots listening to you and I'm sure there's lots more we can talk about outside of this too most definitely so maybe something fun. again in the future anyway yeah definitely so I'm discovering yep yeah, we're on season 3 discovering with James DeBolt and we've got Curtis Watts here today and you know we're out of here today so I want to thank you very much everybody thank you Curtis peace enjoy <laughs>